The shows are live on Zoom and YouTube, so be sure to join in and ask your questions. Now here is New Tracks founder and your host, Jim Kello MMR. Well, good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We hope you'll come back often and hope you tell your friends about us. And also, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas, a great New Year, and just overall a wonderful holiday season. Uh, before we start the show, I want to introduce Father Ron Walters for the show's prayer. Father Walters. Oh God, as we create and miniature the world around us, may we marvel at the beauty and genius which created the world and instilled in us a portion of your great knowledge and wisdom. Give success to the work of our hands, O oh God. Amen. Father Ron, thank you so very much. Can't thank you enough for all of your contributions that, uh, that you make to the show. We really do appreciate it. Well, now I want to uh, run a video of the show sponsor. And the show sponsor is Dennis Model Railroading. For over 25 years, Brennan's Model Railroading has been offering unique products for the oat scale market. Our flagship product, Brennan's Better Ballast, was an instant hit and continues to be the industry leader. Its prototypical size and natural color blend of real crushed granite make it the choice for discerning modelers. Since then, we've developed a complementary line of natural ground cover materials. Additionally, we offer craftsman kits that anyone can build with complete photographically illustrated instructions that assume you've never done this before. The Sonky Wanky Coffee Company is the latest and the fourth kit to be added to our ongoing and highly popular limited edition Ellison Tribute series. These kits take Ellison's scratch-built iconic structures to a new level with Dennis Spin. The idea being, that if Frank were alive today, this is how we would build these models using modern methods and materials. Use the QR code to visit our website. You know, I really got some great news today. Uh, I was talking to Dennis Brennan, and Dennis said that uh, he really appreciated uh, being able to participate in our show and be the sponsor of it because it's significantly helping his business. He's getting inquiries, he's selling product. And frankly, I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, because that, that's, from my standpoint, that's why the manufacturers that we try to support should be supporting us. Uh, you've heard me talk about the scholarship. I think every manufacturer that we've had on the show, we haven't charged anything for them, to them. We haven't asked them to pay a thing. I've never asked anybody to send me a kit. Uh, all, all we've asked is for them to uh, give a discount to you, the modeler on the show that wants to build along with them. Well, I think for our scholarship, I think they ought to contribute. I, I think every one of them. I don't care if it's a dollar. I don't care if it's five dollars. I don't care what it is. I just think they ought to contribute to our show. Now, some of them have. And for those that have, thank you so very, very much. You know, and, and I have told you privately how much I appreciate it. But for the rest of them, I, I don't know why you won't. Maybe you don't think anything of our show. Maybe you don't think our show's worth, worth uh, coming to. I don't know. We've done everything we can to promote you. We've done everything we can to tell people about you and to give people the opportunity to uh, to 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 see the products that you produce and to, to come in direct contact with you. So I think you ought to support our scholarship. I think the young people that are gonna be your future customers deserve your support. 
And I think you can show that with our scholarship. Now, we have a scholarship a challenge of $1,000. That, that grant and that, that scholarship challenge only applies to donations under $80. So if it's a dollar, that counts. If it's $20, that counts. If it's $80, that counts. $81 doesn't count. So we don't want large do donations from the individuals on the show and watching the show and, and, and people who may have benefited the show, benefited from the show, frankly, as Dennis Brennan is benefiting right now. And so all we ask is, we need to cover that $1,000. Well, we've covered $621 of that $1,000 so far. And we've got until December the 31st to reach $1,000. So we need almost $400 more between now and the end of December. So we've got this show and three more shows and the magazines that are out right now that I beg and ask people to contribute in. And if we don't reach the $1,000, then we don't get the match. So if we don't get the other $400 or $379, then it's not $379 that we lose. We lose twice that much. We lose, what, $750 or so. And for our scholarships, that's an awful lot of money to lose. So we ask you, please consider a donation. It's easy to do on Zephy. You can put your cell phone up to that QR code right now and, and uh, be at Zephy. Zephy doesn't charge you anything. They don't charge us anything. Every penny that's donated goes direct to the scholarship. So guys, a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, volunteer their time on these shows to try to make it as, as entertaining and as educational as we can possibly think about doing it. We've tried a lot of things over the last four years. Next year, we'll be going into our fifth year of doing this once a week. No one's been paid a penny for doing it. No one's asked for any models. No one's asked for favors. No one's asked for anything. This has been our gift as far as I'm concerned. And we've enjoyed every second of trying to do it. But we think our scholarship is significant. We're the only organization out there doing it for these kids. And we think our kids in this hobby that are the future of our hobby deserve our support. So please, we're not asking for $100, 200. We're not asking for big bucks. Either. We're just asking for you to be one of the people that we're going to be talking about at the end of this year on the show on the 27th of December that has contributed to our scholarship. And we think that, uh, we think our scholarship deserves your support, frankly. I'm, uh, I'm gonna be so disappointed if I'm the one that has to call up the, the donor and apologize for not being able to figure out a way to get a match for his thousand dollars because I'm just not competent enough to do it because I just don't understand the model railroad community that I've been a part of all my life well enough to try to get this message across to a way, in a way that hits people in their gut and in their heart. So we need almost $400 to get our thousand dollar match. And we ask for you please to help us. All right, that's it, I'm, I give up, all right. Our newsletter, I hope you like it. Uh, we've had some favorable comments. I had one guy send me a long email that told me that, that I was the most incompetent person in the world for even trying to put out the newsletter. Uh, and I responded to him very nicely. Uh, but we do hope you enjoy it. We hope you'll participate in it. Martin wants to hear from you. If you have an item that you think is of interest to everybody, Send it to Martin, he'll put it in there. We're not trying to compete with magazines. This is us, guys. You're, you're here, most, most of you are here almost every Wednesday night. We're, we're talking to each other. This is just a way for us to communicate. And not only between us, but to the model railroad community that thinks enough of us to want to hear what we're talking about. That's what the newsletter is all about. 
So talk to us. Send Martin some information. Uh, later on, Martin, when he's on the show, he'll put up his email address so that people can send this stuff directly to him. Don't send it to me because I can't do it. Martin is the editor of our great newsletter. He's doing a fantastic job. I personally think the December newsletter was a success, was a major success for us. Martin put it together in about a month. No more than that from the concept of the idea to the first uh, edition. And like I said, we're not trying to compete with anybody. We're talking to the members of, the, of New Tracks Modeling that we talk to every, every show, that we talk to every time I write an article in the two magazines. It's the same group of people. We're just trying to do it a different way and trying to give information in a better format than we have in the past. So we want you to help us do that too. Send your information direct to Martin. Well, the My Build. My Build is really growing and I'm so happy it is. I'm so happy to see new people that haven't done it before participate. And I hope in 2024, we only can double and triple the number of people participating. We're going to do everything we can. Chris and I have talked about it. And, and it's going to be tough in January, February, because we're just moving into this. But as soon as possible, we want to devote the whole two-hour show to nothing but my bills once a month. We want everybody to have as much time and show as many models or talk about the problems they're having building a model as they need. And we want to allocate a whole show to do it. Well, the next show we've got coming up is in two weeks, the 20th of December, at which time I hope that we have, I don't have to talk about the challenge of the scholarship anymore. But anyway, that's when we have the next one coming up, the 20th of December, and Chris Kors is the host, and Chris Kors is here to tell you all about it. Chris? Oh, geez, what an intro. Thanks, Jim. Hey, um, the uh, next My Build is, uh, let me get the slide up for you here. Next My Build is in a few weeks. It is on uh, December 20th. Uh, it is a holiday theme. Uh, that being said, uh, feel free to deviate and talk about winter, snow scenery, um, go as far as uh, billboard cars, um, you know, food cars even that, that are uh, somewhat uh, related. Uh, snow plows, uh, people ice skating, holiday lighting, holiday decorations, those sorts of things. Uh, in fact, uh, Greg uh, said something, um, he mentioned something on the internet the other day about how he's looking for some snow. And uh, I've got a diorama that's actually on the floor behind me that I use for some photography that uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out the pictures and I'm going to show, um, I'm going to show what that diorama looks like. Actually, um, there's a picture of it in the bottom right corner. Um but uh, I'll I'll throw some uh, some some pictures together and show you exactly what uh, what that diorama is all about and um, the 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 things the the the, cha the challenges that I faced in doing that uh, because I actually built it in I want to say July and uh, first time I took it out um, uh, it was like 95 degrees outside and when I was editing the photographs I got a ch I got a chill. Because uh, I was able to to scope it in, uh, crop it down just right, and uh, we got the the proper snow effects from it. But anyway, uh, like I said, uh, we've got a holiday theme. So whatever you can do to fit in that, uh, please send us your f photos, uh, railrunner130 at hotmail.com. Please have them to me by this Sunday prior. That way we can uh, put it all together and uh, do it justice. And uh, if you have not participated in the My Builds before, please include a photo of yourself. That way we can uh, include that in your uh, title card. And um, what we've seen in the past is we've had some people that uh, were not able to make it. So please uh, put a description in there as well in the event that you can't make it. So anyway, I will turn it back over to you, Jim, and I will put my... Uh, I'll put my email address in the chat so people can follow along. Or send well, thank you so info. very much. And I hope you and your family have a Merry Christmas. And thanks so much for doing this for the whole year, Chris. It's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful trip. And I hope 2024 uh, is, is as great as I anticipate it's going to be. Yeah, thanks, Jim. All right. So let's start the show tonight. 
Uh, you may remember last week when I talked about starting the, uh, the scale segments uh, once a month. Well, last uh, for the December month uh, or the November month, the last one was the G scale one. And Alan Rogers was the uh, sponsor of it. And Alan was also the host for it that night. So far, that one segment of our show that, that Earl Hackett breaks out from the, uh, the total show has received 113 views. So 113 modelers after the show have gone to that specific show segment and watched it. That doesn't count the, the 250 or 270 or something like that views of the total show. And it doesn't count the other segments of the shows that have been viewed. But of that one that Alan Rogers company sponsored and Alan was the host of, he had 113 people view his show. I think that's pretty good. It's something that we just started in November. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, I'm encouraged uh, by the, the enthusiasm that we're starting to have for these individual segments about a specific scale. Tonight, we have two of them. The first one is O Scale Modeling. Our sponsor is O Scale Central's Association. Uh, and if we could run that video, uh, Pat. I'm David Vaughn of O-Scale Central. O-Scale 2-Rail, models built to 1 to 48 scale and running on 2-Rail track, is the best kept secret in model railroading. We're pleased to team with Jim Kello to introduce O-Scale 2-Rail to new tracks viewers. O-Scale 2-Rail is for modelers. At twice the scale and eight times the mass of HO, O-Scale's heft and ease of modeling create an outstanding model railroading experience. O-Scale 2-Rail modeling is as varied as railroading itself. Modern era, transition, or old time, standard gauge, or narrow. A wide variety of models is available at affordable prices. There is a supportive community and lots of shows, clubs, and events. You can explore O-Scale 2-Rail by going to our website, oscalecentral.com. You will find information about the scale and how to get started, as well as a free, searchable, scale-wide product and service guide and listings of coming O-Scale events. You will also find information about how to join O-Scale Central. We promote O-Scale 2-Rail and support modelers in the scale. When your eyes are going by Focular, when you need fresh challenges, keep O-Scale 2-Rail in mind. Check us out, oscalecentral.com. Thanks. I really want to thank the association for their support and for sponsoring this segment. I belong to that association, uh, and uh, I think David Vaughn is doing a fantastic job. He has more than doubled the membership since he took over as president, and I think that's quite an accomplishment. I'm not sure that the O-Scale community really appreciates how much this association has changed from what it used to be. Uh, I never belonged to the, uh, the O Scale Kings. Uh, I did it one time for a very brief period of time, but I wasn't getting anything out of it. O Scale Central, I am getting something out of it. And uh, as you can see by them reaching out and wanting to support our show, uh, I can say that they truly are trying to do some things for the O Scale community, and I really appreciate that. So to the uh, association, thank you so much for supporting this segment on our show. And with that segment, I'd like to introduce the host for this segment, David Schultz, who also is a board member of this association. David, welcome. Well, thank you, Jim. I had this whole show planned out and then we had a little faux pas here. I realized <laughs> the videos, the videos I had picked to run on this show won't show up on my iPad. So I'm a little technology band, but my son James is on here. Uh, would they be able to uh, jump over to his, uh, uh, you know, highlight him as he shows the videos that I wanted to show? Is, is that possible to do? Yes. Okay. Well, then we'll start the show here. We're going to talk about the size. I've I've heard for the longest time, you know, that O scale is one of those models that if you're going to do O scale, you got to have at least a warehouse or maybe even a football field to build model railroad into, uh, at least a large basement. Well, 
that's not necessarily true. And I'm, I'm going to try and show my son's layout is uh, basically 25 by 33 feet. That's the size of his basement. The room I'm building is 14 by 21. And I wish I had more to show right now, but I don't. But in the future, I will. But one of the things I, I, I had figured out early on was that I would go around to model railroad shows and I'd see portable layouts. And I would stand there and look at them and I'd think, okay, well, this is, this is a nice size. And I'd ask them, well, how big is this? And they'd tell me things like, well, this is, you know, 10 feet by 18 feet. Well, my room's 14 by 21. So that, that portable would fit in my room. So it convinced me that I would be able to build a viable railroad in a 14 by 21 rail room. So to build in a room of that size or whatever size you've got, I've seen some impressive railroads in very small spaces, but you may have to change, you know, the direction you're going. Uh, I, I'm not a big switching type of guy. I like to orbit stuff and I can do that on my railroad, but some people enjoy switching. Well, you may want to go to like an industrial railroad, you know, where you're switching out nothing but industry, small locomotives, and that's easily fits into small areas. Or you may want to model a branch line, maybe a main line that comes in and you've got four or five industries there that you could switch out. You could do that kind of thing. I'm, when I worked on the Wisconsin Central, uh, we had a town, Hayward, Wisconsin. There were only two industries in that town, uh, Louisiana Pacific and Johnson Timber. And we had basically a main line, the two spurs that went off the industries and a 10 car siding. And we'd bring 40 cars in and it took some some special moves, but we were able to get loads out uh, out of both industries and put them in areas and then bring their empties and spot them up. It took us around four hours to do all this, but you, it can be done. So anyway, I'd like to start, if you could uh, spotlight James there, we're gonna start in his part of the model railroad, which is St. Regis. Um, I can talk about a little bit. It's a two foot by 11 foot area. Uh, that comes off his main model railroad. There we go. And you can see he's got a warehouse at the end. He's got uh, five tracks, four spots on that track. So as he starts down here, the, the two, two tracks uh, uh, to the left are the main line and a siding that represent the Northern Pacific. Now in St. Regis, the Northern Pacific actually passed over the Milwaukee Road, but on his railroad, the two kind of combined together. But he's got the main line and the siding there. He's got the, the yard track, basically, for putting, putting your loads or empties, whichever. The track next to that is where the sawdust cars will go. So he can spot up sawdust in there. And then you've got the warehouse, which has got, you know, he's got the building set up so that you'll actually look into the warehouse. And then the track with the tank car is where the, the glues and resins will go that are used to make plywood or OSB, whatever the plant made there. And then down at the far end there is where you spot up the logs that are brought in. So his main plan is you have the train leave the Avery yard and the train will arrive in St. Regis. The locomotive will cut off the loads. They will grab the empties that the switch engine has already switched out and they will leave. And then the switch engine works on, on uh, spotting all the cars in their proper place. He had an open house here not too long ago, and there were two people working on that small area, which I heard three or four people comment that they couldn't believe you could get that much action in that small an area. But it took them two hours to spot 12 cars. So it's rather ingenious how it's set up because you really got to use your head or you're going to get yourself boxed in pretty easily. So... Anyway, that's his St. Regis area. Um, he's got, like I say, four spots, his main line, the siding, the warehouse. Now, the beauty of the warehouse is that it offers a view block. One of the things that you learn about small railroads is you do not, you do not want to look across the room at the model railroad. You'd like to have some view blocks in there so that people have to look around the view blocks and such. Well, the warehouse blocks the view of the end of the track. And if you want to do it, make that look even bigger, uh, where those three tracks end, you could put a mirror back there to make the railroad look like it continues on. But I think the warehouse where it's sitting is kind of clever because it blocks the view of the ends of the tracks. So it makes that little portion seem that much bigger. So uh, then on the other side of his layout is Avery, Idaho. So you'll wander around over there. 
And over here, he's got four yard tracks. He's got a main and a siding, and he's got the shop facilities that he's building. And once again, the beauty of that is that the main line passes against the wall. Well, with the yard and the shop facilities and all, all of that, it blocks the view of the train. You can see it coming into the yard and you see it exiting the yard, but a lot of it is, is, uh, is hidden behind cars and facilities and such. Kind of an interesting way to make the layout look larger. And this portion of the layout is 15 by 25 feet. And he's, he's crammed a lot into this small area. And it adds a lot of interest. Now, the neat part about this is even though the basement is only 25 by 33, all of his curves on the outer loops are 90, 90 inch. He's even got some 100 inch curves in there. And we're talking big locomotives. Where you know he's talking box cabs, he's got little Joes, he's got bipolars, and all of them are capable of running on this railroad with ease. Uh, turnouts, I believe, are like number sixes to number eights, so that even the turnouts are pretty good sized. They they fit in this area beautifully. Um, the 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 uh, service facility where the roundhouse is located. He's got a, a turntable pit and he's going to have like a four track roundhouse there. Now it's pretty, pretty small compared to the actual roundhouse that was in Avery, Idaho, but you'll get, you get the idea. And one of the things you can do with a small railroad is detail, lots and lots of detail. In fact, you get enough detail into an area, people will, will always discover something new on your small railroad. And with a small railroad, it's not an impossible task. You know, if you were if you did have a huge basement and you build a railroad, you'd probably have to forego a lot of detail and get, you know, get your main scenery up. But on a smaller layout, you can do things like uh, James on his railroad is putting in every joint bar, you know, every 39 feet. So we take the sectional track that we have and we're cutting it with a jeweler saw every 39 feet and uh, and then putting the joint bars in there. So you still have electrical continuity, but. It gives you the appearance of 39 foot rails everywhere. And with steel wheels on all your cars, you'll hear them clicking and clacking all the way down the railroad. And people enjoy, you know, looking at the details. Uh, yeah, I see somebody commented that he's going to have an electric shed there and he will be building that. It'll be a little bit smaller, but it should be able to hold two units in there. But the electric shed there, you can see the cutout where that electric shed is going to go. So the whole area is going to be very busy. And with all the detail, once he gets the, you know, once he finishes up that area, you can fill the roundhouse. He'll have big windows on there, which the Milwaukee Road didn't have in their roundhouse. But to show off the detail, he's decided to put windows in his roundhouse. And people will, when, when it's complete, probably stand there and look in those windows quite a bit just to see what's going on inside the roundhouse. So that should be kind of fun in that area, too. Um on the other side of his wall here, because he's got he's got a natural view block in the house. He's got a brick wall that comes down and then the staircase. So on this side of the railroad is basically in the mountains. That's the Dick Creek trestle he's showing off there with the backdrops that he painted. And we hear constantly when people come over to his railroad, they, they are amazed because in the photographs, the railroad looks huge. And they get down in the basement and they said, well, this isn't that big, but it sure looks big. Well, using some of the hints, you know, the view blocks, the mirrors and, and uh, detail, you can make a scene look so much bigger than it actually is. So that's his trestle. Uh, off to the left, there's going to be tunnel number 32, I think he said. He's got it started. Uh, that'll be another little view block. And... Uh, the other part about the, these little view blocks, he's got sound in all of his locomotives. Well, you line the inside of those tunnels with egg cartons and the sound will, will almost stop when it goes in the mountains, but the engine will come roaring out of the tunnel, which is a really neat effect also, but that's for another show. Anyway, this room, like the other room, is only 15 by 30. Um, this is, uh, there you can see across the room. It... Uh, He's, East Portal is going to be the, he'll have a substation in the corner. And then, of course, we uh, cut a hole in the wall and that'll be another tunnel. That's going to be Pipestone Pass at the far end of his basement. And it really does give the effect of a huge railroad when the train keeps disappearing from sight and you have to walk around the wall to see the, uh, the rest of the layout. So 
anyway, with all the detail and all of the, you know, uh, all of, he'll have the overhead wire. He's going to have the, you know, the big electrics running around. He's got St. Regis for the switching part of it. All of this makes for a really fascinating railroad in a, in a in relatively, a relatively small, small area. area. So, so anyway, anyway. that uh, pretty much covers my uh, part of the show for uh, size. If anybody has any questions, I have other railroads I can show in the future. If, if people are interested in seeing more of this kind of thing, I can certainly make some of my other shows dedicated to, to small railroads. If I get around and see small railroads, I'll videotape it. And then I'm going to have to learn how you get those videos to show up on the show here. So, so that'll be something for the future. Does anybody have any questions for David? Comments, ideas. How do you like his idea about showing small layouts? What do you want to see on O scale modeling? I'd love to see small O scale layouts, uh, two rail and standard gauge. I'm presently okay. a narrow gauge, but um, I've seen some here up in Canada. One fellow, he's moved out of Toronto and he's down in uh, in New Brunswick now, but I think he used to write articles for the old scale resource. Hmm. Uh, and he, he was doing uh, uh, switching layouts in bedroom size, uh, ten, 10 by eight, something like that. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. I can say there was a railroad in Chicago. I used to go to it every year and the man had put a old scale layout in a, in a one car garage. He, it was an apartment and he had a one car garage and it was very narrow, but fairly long. And he was running a Southern Pacific uh, GS4 around that layout. And it was modeled after the Sioux line, which was kind of hilarious, but he had a depot there, the ice house. And it was amazing uh, what he was able to do in that one car garage. So yeah, I would, uh, I would, uh, if I get around and see some more of these railroads, I'll, I'll gladly film them and, and show them in other shows because some of these places get very clever. There's a gentleman up in, in Canada who's got a page that that he shows off his railroad and it's in a bedroom. And it's, it's rather right. phenomenal how uh, how much he can cram into that little bedroom. That's the but, fellow I'm talking Mike Cullum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he details everything to a T. You know, his, his one yard or one industry track has got litter all over the track garbage cans laying around it, yeah. you know you'd almost swear it was real when you look at it so well, that and guy, all, yeah, instead of dave have to be the one to go, have to figure out how to go around and find all of these if you know of a modeler who's got a small low gauge or scale ray, layout then ask him to take some uh, a video of it and send it to dave uh, dave can put his email in the uh, uh chat function so you'll know how to reach him and, and we'll show, and, and um, maybe the guy can be on and be interviewed as we're looking at his model railroad. I think that would be great, and, and yep. be able to show a wide range of, of what's available in O-Scale and what, what creative modelers are doing to be able to get the most out of an O-Scale in the space that they have available. So uh, I think Dave would appreciate as much information from everybody as he can possibly uh, beg, bar, and steal. Yeah, and then later on after the <clears throat> after the show here, I'll figure out how to get videos to <laughs> upload on the show. <laughs> well, Dave, thanks so much. You're Thank and your son James. We really do appreciate it tonight. All right, thanks, Jim. Yes, sir. Well, now I want to turn to the uh, the next uh, uh, presenter, which is uh, Dennis uh, Brennan, and Dennis's segment is is uh, uh, sponsored by a new uh, company uh, that, frankly, I'm not familiar with. Why? Because I'm a trolley modeler, and th this person makes things that I think are absolutely outstanding. They're all made in the U.S. I, I talked to uh, Alan, and uh, I was really impressed with, uh, with his company, with his philosophy, and what he's accomplishing. Uh, and, and as soon as we can get the video that we're working on for him right now, we'll show that next week. Uh, but we do have uh, his uh, website up here. We do have uh, the, the logo of his company, and I want to uh, to thank so much uh, Alan uh, Zamoski, uh, who owns the uh, the Millhouse River Studio, uh, for sponsoring this uh, high rail segment of our show with the host Dennis Brennan. And with that said, I'll turn it over to you, Dennis. Welcome.
Hi. Thank you, Jim. Now, oh, I got to put my email in the <laughs> um, chat here. So um, let me do that real quick here while I'm talking to you. I can hear somebody talking in the background. Dave, you, oh need, Dave, you need to turn off. I was your, thinking about. Uh, Dave, Dave, you need to turn your mic off. Or Pat, if you can. Go ahead, Dennis. You're muted, Dennis. I also want to thank um, Al. <laughs> Can we hear me? Yep, now. Okay. Thank you, Jim. And I also want to thank uh, Al Zamorski from uh, Millhouse River Studios for sponsoring this show. Um, uh, Al's a buddy of mine. He's also a high railer. And um, uh, he jumped right in and said, yes, let's do it. So what, what I hope to do with these segments uh, over the coming months is to um, talk about modeling because that's what high rail is all about. Um, the only difference between what I'm doing as a high railer and what another modeler in a different scale is doing is the fact that I have three rail track and I'm using, you know, I may be using uh, uh, different couplers, um, but as far as it goes, everything I do is scale. I'm using scale cars, uh, and um, and what is high rail? Well, high rail is for those guys who started with toy trains and decided they wanted to go a little bit further. And by that I mean when you'd get tired of just running around on a flat plywood tabletop, and you start to add scenery, and you start to want to make it look more real well you you've walked into the the high rail and how far you go into it that's up to you um but when you get to to what i'm doing and a lot of us are doing now um there's no difference between what we do and what other modelers are doing in different scales and it, the the point is it doesn't matter if you're a th in in O scale or N scale or HO, you're going to have people who do really exquisite modeling and some who just like to set up something and let it run. I mean, it happens. Just because you're in uh, uh, another scale doesn't mean that you're a modeler. Um, so with that said, um, what I would like to talk about today is I'm going to introduce you to kit bashing which is something that I love to do. And uh, over the next few shows, I'm going to talk about various types of kit bashing and how you can, uh, um, the things you can do with simple, uh, simple little um, things like just painting. With that said, let's go right here to, um, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, let's see. All right. And, we're going to look at this right here. Can everybody see that all right? Um, yes. All right. This is a, this is basically um, a Plasticville switch tower. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's Plasticville. Well, what did I do here? All I did was add a few details and some paint. I mean, it's that simple. And I, I would put that up against any model. Um uh, I wrote an article about that for classic toy trains. Um, I added, you know, I, I added a little um, board along the side of the steps and I added some support for this. And basically I painted it. That's it. Um, and I added some glass um, to the inside and I lit it up and <laughs> put it in a realistic setting. And that's as good as any, uh, any other kit you're going to find. And that's a simple model. This one, this is a Walther's. Well, it was Walther's. It's now Atlas O. It was like Melissa's Deli or I don't know, one of, their, one of those buildings. And all I did was paint and change it from shiny plastic into, um, into a real uh, scale looking brick building. Uh, and um, <laughs> that's another thing that a lot of people don't realize 
is that there are two different kinds of brick. One is called face brick, which is used on the front of a building or a building that faces a street. And another is, is just basically the basic utilitarian brick, which they use on the sides of buildings that are not that that are not um, facing the street. So you'll find them on the sides between buildings and in the back. And we'll get into that a lot more later when I show you how to do that in another episode. Here is um, simple Plasticville hobo shacks. All I did was <laughs> add a little paint and freed up some of the boards that were, um, that were um, molded in so that they're now sticking out. Uh, and it's just basically paint and put it in a realistic setting. It doesn't get any simpler than that. So kit bashing, while that's not really a kit bash, it is what I call a kit enhancement. Now here is an actual kit bash of a Plasticville diner. Simple little Plasticville diner. I used um, two kits to make it wider. Um, which meant I also had to make the roof wider. And then I just, um, I added all additional details to bring out what's already there. Um, I changed the door a little bit. Uh, I I actually filled in the Plasticville Diner that was on here. And um, I made my own logo, Dots Diner. And then I added these little pieces of plastic to enhance the, the three-dimensionality of it, and then painted it. It's that simple. Here's another one, and we'll talk about this too, and I think we're going to talk about that in uh, January or February. Um, this is a Plasticville Suburban Station, and I added, um, uh, I toned down the, the white plastic stucco with, with just um, uh, some spackle. I painted it. I cut out the windows and added grant line windows. I switched the, I switched these doors. Um, this really was uh, a, a two doors. One was here and one was in the back of the building. And I put those together and took the door in the back of the building and, um, um, and took the door that was here, which was, there were two of these. I split that in half and put one here and one here. And then I just covered the dock with, uh, with um, coffee stirrer strips. And I added some screening here, left off a few boards. And uh, we got a building I'd put up against any O-scale kit. Um, here is a couple kit bashes that I did. This is from a Plasticville airplane hanger, believe it or not. And this is what I call basically a scratch bash because I used these walls from the building and then I scratch built the other walls that you can't see in this photo, but we will cover this in another episode. And this one here, this is this Lionel... Um, electrical powerhouse buildings. I use five different kits to make this this um, this kit bash here, carp machinery. And I use some molding and we'll talk about how I how I kept the windows um, looking like they were. Um, anyway, that's that is all there is to that one. And here is another kit bash that I use. These are two IHC um uh, row house kits. They had pointy roofs, um, and you'll see them in the next, the next photo. Uh, uh, they were storefronts kits, and I converted that into a kind of a building that used to be across the street from where I lived when I was a kid. Now, he, these are the three buildings. Um, those are the IHC kits, and we'll see them down below too. Um, these three this building here is three different kits. Again, this was uh, uh, a Walther's kit, and these were Walther's kits. They're now Atlas O, and I just joined them together and made like a, you know, a block long building. And this is the back side of that building right here. And these are the three IHC uh, buildings. And what I did with them is I cut the roof down on top 
so that I could make it look like this was a porch extension. Um, and I made three different versions of it. Um, one, they called, they, they had porches that were open, just like over here, but they decided to cover them up and enclose them. And this one is um, has three different porches too, but there's different colors uh, that I used on each building. And you often see that in the neighborhood. So those are just some simple ideas that you can do. Um, and uh, I don't... Um, uh, I don't have anything more to say about kit bashing. I will, um, if you guys want to come back to me, um, we can do that. Um, and we can, uh, if Jim will tell me how much time I got left, I'll wrap it up. If you need time, we can wrap this up and I'll see you next month with high rail um, modeling. Why don't we do that, Dennis? Because we, we are so packed tonight. I, I guess fine. the most important thing that I get out of this and that I hope everybody gets out of this, when you look at a scene like it's on the screen right now, that could be two rail or three rail. If you don't see the number of rails there, if you don't, see, don't pay any attention to that, if you just look at that modeling and keep in mind, that's what this show is all about. I don't care if it's two rail or three rail. If, if a person can do that, creativity and bring that kind of a, a, a picture of art uh, with a model railroad, that's the kind of person that, that, that this show should appeal to. This, this show should appeal to people who want to achieve that level of market modeling excellence. I don't care what kind of uh, track they run on. So Dennis, thanks so much for sharing with us, with us tonight, and we'll see you next week. All right. Thank you, Jim. And thank, uh, thank everybody for tuning in. And if you have any questions, concerns, problems, or um, uh, suggestions, email me at Dennis at Brennan's model RR.com. You can go to my website and um, uh, my phone number is there and um, uh, I'll be glad to talk to you if you want. And Dennis, if you could put that information in the, uh, the chat function when you get a chance, I'd appreciate it so everybody can have it. Okay, I'll do it. Thank you. All right, now, thank you. But now don't go anywhere because we've got <laughs> another segment here that, that I want to, uh, to get, take care of, and that's the completion of your uh, uh, build-along of your uh, coffee factory. Yep. So if we can turn to that one now and have you wrap that one up for us. All right. Um, let there me, it is. Uh, let me... Uh, See if I can get that on the screen here. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing my. You got it on the screen, but it isn't as large as you would like it, probably. Yeah, probably not. All right, let me see if I can. Uh, well, let's don't piddle too much with this. Let's uh, just go ahead. Here. Yeah, How's let's, that? Let's uh, get on with you. All right. So this is the Sankey Wanky Coffee Company. Um, we've been. We've been modeling this thing uh, or building this thing over the weeks. Um, and I just need to uh, be able to get back to, uh, hold on, just give me a second. I just have to get back to, uh, I um, changed the view here and now I got to see my, all right, let's see. I may have to move on here, Dennis. I mean, I you know, we've only got so much time. I hate to push you, but. All right. No, I see what you're, you know, I see what we're talking about. I can't, I can't find my fields. They're not showing up and I can't get to the, uh, huh, I don't know why that happened. Um, hmm. Well, let me, do, let me do this, Dennis. Let me go to uh, Martin Breckfield. For his scratch oh, building. here it is. I got oh. it. Okay. All right. Here we go. Sorry All about right. that. Okay. Um, we'll wrap this up pretty quick. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, here we go. Uh, when I put the building together, finally, I always like to. I always like to put two walls: a front and a, a side, and a back, and a front and the other side. And if you always have, if you if you build it that way, you also notice it's also on a glass cutting board. 
and I have um, taped a carpenter square to it. And by putting the two sides against the carpenter square and using um, some um, some machine blocks against this to keep everything straight, um, you're going to get a perfect right angle and you're going to get it. It's going to be vertical. That's the key. Make sure that you have right angles and everything is vertical. And um, I did the same thing over here. This kit is a little different because of the way it's constructed. Um, and that's more, that's explained in the instructions. I won't go into it here right now, but again, the idea is to keep everything vertical and, um, uh, and uh, perpendicular. And I've done that using the cutting board and a flat piece of glass here, which is, uh, you know, that helps. Um, this building is also set on a foundation, which we built in the very beginning. Um, one of the things to remember is that the, there's going to be a little reveal inside. The brickwork is flush with the edge of the foundation on the outside. And again, I have placed it on the foundation and I have used, I have used these nice little, um, 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 bars to um, hold it in place. And I have used super glue for this whole thing. And I just run it along the seam, uh, like along here and let capillary action suck it into the joint. I use the, um, I use the, uh, liquid super glue in spots like this and also uh, down the sides of the building. Um, and you also see here, um, I've added another layer of brickwork to the inside uh, of the, the roof line. And that's because we have a nice, um, we have a nice uh, cornice over the roof and and uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't think it shows up in this one. Anyway, that covers up the cornice and you can see the bricks. The bricks will be above the roof when we get that done. Um, we're doing the roof next. And that's easy. Uh, that's made out of a heavy um, art cart. Uh, we're supposed to be black on both sides and black all the way through. But... but um, got the wrong thing by mistake it doesn't matter um, but just know that the white side goes up because each side is slightly different and uh you it can only go on you only want to put it on the way that it's shown so be careful about that um because there's slots in here for the other things that go on the roof and the roof is um tar paper and there are guides um, uh, that show you how to line up one strip against the other one. Uh, again, uh, liquid super glue is applied. Um, and this roof just fits up underneath. It fits up, you put the roof in from below and it fits up underneath those pieces that we added to the back side of the roof. And it'll make more sense when you're actually working on the kit. Here's the cupola, um, uh, not the cupola. This is the uh, elevator penthouse. That's pretty simple. I won't go into any detail there. Um, let's see. And then we also have, this is the final bit. This is what the penthouse looks like when it's done. Again, it gets tar paper strips. They're peel and stick. Um, the cupola is this simple here. It's supposed to represent concrete um, and um, uh, slotted vents. And you can see here, here's the roof and here is the nice uh, brickwork that lines the inside of the roof. And then here's the cornice. You can see this doesn't have a cornice here, but there, um, but this is a cornice right there. Uh, and here's how that all goes together. It's a chimney cap with two little pipes. And um, we also have a little bit of overlap here so that you can see it's like uh, they just extended the car tar paper up here. Um, and this little uh, porch 
um, is easy enough to build. Just like that. It's a very simple thing, but it adds so much detail to it. And uh, I know I rushed through this, but um, we're short for time. So if anybody has any questions, I'll I'll answer those uh, on an email or in a phone call. Okay, back to you, Jim. Well, Dennis, I'll tell you, I, I'm really impressed with your structure. Most of all, I'm impressed with your instructions. When you, you and I have talked at length privately about the importance of uh, instructions for uh, for a kit to really be buildable by a modeler. And I, I got to hand it to you. I'm, I'm really impressed with the, uh, the instructions that you've included in your kit. And uh, thanks so much for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Jim. And thanks for everybody who's tuning in. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next shows. And um, this is your program, as Jim says. So if anybody has anything to, to add to what I'm doing, let me know. Fantastic, Dennis. You have a good evening. Thank you. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. Well, now I want to turn to Martin Breckfield for his Scratch Builders Corner. Martin, welcome. And Martin, by the way, thanks for producing our first news newsletter that I think was an absolute jewel of a newsletter. Thank you so much for your help. Oh, thanks, Jim. I had fun putting it together. I always tend to have fun. If I don't have fun, then I don't do it. So that solves that problem. Um, let's see. I think Dennis is still sharing. Yeah, he needs to get off. Sorry. Exit, Dennis. All right, hold on. Uh, there we are. Okay. That was good. Thank now, you, Dennis. Yeah. Okay, so pick up where we left off last week. If you were here, if I was here, if we were here. Okay, here we go. So what did we do last week? Oh, yeah, we got the body assembled and started on some details. We're going to have fun tonight with more parts and more details and some odds and ends. Uh, take a look at the roof and uh, work on a radial coupler for the one end. Since we got a radial coupler end, we need a coupler there. Uh, and we only need one on this car. So, you know, buying a pair of them is a pain. So, so making your own is actually uh, more expedient. So there's the roof. Uh, grant line supports and some, uh, I think those are three by fours. They come out to being very close to size of the grant line uh, roof walk supports on the height. I've learned over the last decade that the three by four is actually a very interesting piece of wood. It actually fits a lot of grant line parts that you think a four by four should fit. Uh, where do you get three by fours? Well, I got all mine from uh, Kapler. So, you know, there are places you can get scale lumber in, in oddball sizes, like uh, three by fours and five inch and seven inch odd numbers, as opposed to the standard uh, positive numbers. Okay, so. Now we got something going on at the other end of this car. Uh, some screening on some posts, long, tall stakes. The screening came out of a nice sealed bag with a label on it that said coal loads. And I thought, those aren't coal loads, are they? I mean, it's a very unusual looking coal load. Uh, but I, I said, well, I'll just throw that in the parts bin. Someday I'll need that. And uh, someday has arrived. And I don't know where these actually come from or who makes them. They're metal. And they are in there sandwiched between, oddly enough, three by fours and one by fours. Uh, sandwiched because I thought it seemed to be the easiest way to support the metal other than uh, epoxy. And it's less messy. A little bit of goo, a little bit of CA, you squeeze them together. They're not coming apart again, and it's sandwiched together. Trim off the ends, stick them in the stake pockets. Done. Do both sides. Uh, they're lined up across from each other, fairly close, uh, within reason, within reason of a doubt. So what goes in between there, one may ask. So there's the other side. 
Oddly enough, it looks just like the other side, only reversed. Well, we'll go back to the roof for a while. Uh, my usual tar paper on the roof. Yes, the Panera napkins, which I happen to like, cut into strips, put down with about 50% carpenter's glue dissolved in water, just paint them on, put them in place, overlap them 50%. And you can see the, the lines where they overlap. These are, This will get painted later, but we need to get this on now so we can paint everything else. And there's what goes in between the, the fencing. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this is or where it came from. Uh, somebody threw it at me years ago and said, here, maybe you can make something with this. It looks very electrical. It has a lot of insulators that I have added to it from precision scale and some of my own resin castings. It's all hooked up with wire, needs some paint, some touch up here and there. Uh, needs some wire trimmed off it. There's an extra piece of wire. This doesn't belong here. This will get trimmed, this one. Uh, these are precision scale insulators over here. I had a bag of them. It seemed like a good way to get rid of them. Put them to work, put them in a model. Don't leave them in a storage bin. And these are my castings. So, and what holds it together is this little joint right here. This is all soldered together. Uh, this is one of those exercises. Line everything up, clip, clip it together with a small clamp, hit it with flux, hit it with a torch. And actually, I didn't use the torch this time. I hit it with a uh, uh, small soldering iron, just touch each joint, bang, 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 they're all done, finished, solder together. And that's where it's going to go. So that's where it gets test fitted into place. It doesn't stay there right now because we have lots more work to do elsewhere on the car, but I wanted to make sure it actually fit because I'm not good at measuring things some days and uh, sometimes I have to stretch the car and I don't want to do that or shorten the generator system here. But we got to look at the radio coupler. We need a radio coupler at the far end. Uh, some, I've forgotten his name. He sent me a whole bundle of these little brass pieces. He lives out in Montana somewhere and told me the story about who had these made and he sent these to me and you can just mount a KD, you can just mount, mount a KD to it with a number two screw. You just have to drill and tap that through, but it works very nicely actually. And it goes right there. So there's one, that's about where it goes, that red line, that's where I'm gonna cut it off and drill another hole. That'll be a through hole for a, uh, sheet metal, pan head sheet metal screw. And that's what it looks like on the other side. You can see there's a little dimple here, partially hollowed out for drilling for your uh, 256 and no filing needed at all. The KD drops right over that, throw a screw onto it. It's not going anywhere. You could add a washer to it if you needed to, but it, I didn't need to. And there's what it, look like, what it looks like after it's mounted just a sheet metal screw. There's a spring between here and there's two washers on the other side. So it's actually under tension. It stays right where I put it. Uh, I had to grind a little bit off the head of that pan head just to lower it just a little bit so it would scrape too badly on the underbody, which is, as you can tell now, apparently has gotten a coat of stain and a pair of trucks. I'm not quite sure why the trucks are there, but they're there. We're not ready yet. We have other things to do and we'll do them next week. And we'll stop here. And Does anybody have any questions for Martin? Martin, I think that's going to be an absolutely gorgeous car. You know what that is now? What? Substation car. <laughs> well, that's a substation car on your trolley line. No, I did not know that. That is great. They, actually, is had, they actually had such things. and. Yeah. I had an, I found an article on it, and I thought, well, I should I should have one of those, whether I need it or not. Absolutely. Actually, you should have one, and you should have two, and send me one. Oh yeah, if I could find <laughs> if I could find that pile of castings for the electrical stuff at the other end, find another <laughs> set of them. I have no idea. I have no idea where those come from. They're probably HO or something, and, and I for some kit that I know nothing about. 
Listen, before you go tonight, uh, I do want to thank you again for the newsletter. Oh. I think I think the newsletter is really going to uh, to be good for everybody. I think it's a, another way for us to communicate with uh, the uh, model railroad community. And I think uh, hopefully if people like it and, and most importantly, if the viewers contribute to it, if, if we make this not just something that two or three people are writing, but that, that the community that watches new tracks, it's a part of new tracks. It's been a part of new tracks basically from the start. If we can get them to participate actively with you in this newsletter preparation, I think we've got a super winner on our hands. Yeah, and we don't need, you know, the, the, the great American novel to be delivered for it. We don't even want that, actually. You know, a, a, a paragraph and a picture. Or two pictures and two captions. You know, we. what am I working on? What are you working on? I want to show you this. Little stuff. Well, this is not, uh, we're not looking for a major effort from anyone. And if you don't write well, don't worry about it. I'm going to rewrite it anyhow if I have to. I mean, that's my job uh, as, as an editor for multiple publications. So, uh, you know, language, that's just what I, if you think you write poorly, I can tell you right now, I've seen worse. Don't worry about it. See, I know he's talking about me. He's just too nice to mention my name. Anyway, thank no, you, no, no, no. Not you, Jim. I, I, pre <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, all right. So if you've got any questions for Martin, you know what his email is. Just ask him and he'll, he'll uh, respond to you. I guarantee you. I must get 15 emails a day from him and send him probably 20. So uh, I know that he responds. So thanks again, Martin, for everything. We now want to introduce a guy that hasn't been on our show before, Greg Greff. And Greg is with the uh, Hampton Roads Model Railroad Museum. And as everybody knows, I hope, uh, New Tracks uh, is, a, is a great supporter of this project and of, of their museum in Hampton Roads. Hampton Roads is in Virginia, if anybody doesn't know that. It's uh, down in the uh, Tidewater area. Uh, in fact, uh, the Tidewater Division of uh, the Mideast region, uh, the division that I used to belong to, the region that I'm a life member of, uh, includes the Hampton Roads area. So I have some familiarity with the area down there. And I think what what uh, Greg and, and his uh, group are doing is really gonna be spectacular for, for that area down there. And I, I know that uh, they're doing everything they can to get it off the ground. And I'd like for him to, uh, to tell you a little bit about it. So Greg, welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. I appreciate being on the show again and, and uh, nice to see you again. And um, yeah, we're um, making progress uh, slowly. It's uh, um, the biggest bottleneck is uh, trying to get a location. And um, we're hoping to, uh, sort of emulate the San Diego Model Railroad Museum, and they were able to obtain a building from the city uh, 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 without uh, charge. And uh, so we're, we're really trying hard uh, with the seven cities in Hampton Roads to get one of them to sponsor us. But uh, short of that, uh, we'll, uh, I'm, we're very dedicated to it. I'm sure we'll uh, find some way to get it up and running. Um, and uh, we've we've got a website up and and we're accepting donations and you know uh, we're we're getting a few we got a thousand dollars a grant from CSX not long ago and um, so anyway it's it's growing and uh, eventually maybe we'll um, get enough money in the pot to to lease a, a space but there's actually one building that we're really looking at that's been abandoned by the city. Uh, um, uh, it's been open or vacant for about three years now. And it needs a little work, but um, you know, they're not doing anything with it. So if we can get them to give that to us, uh, we'd be great. We'd be very happy. But anyway, we're, we're working on it, talking to city council and all that stuff. So um, anyway, what we want to do just to sort of let everybody know we're trying to get this. Uh, this is a museum that's going to have all scales in it, uh, all the main scales anyway. 
and uh, we we want this to be a, a family. Pat, uh, Pat can, can, can you pardon me just a sec? Pat, can you uh, spotlight him so that we've got him on the screen? There you go. Now, okay, thank you. Okay, you great. Okay, so uh, anyway, um, just to tell you more about what the museum will have, we'll, we're gonna, we want about 10,000 or more square feet um, and we want to have all the scales represented, the, the main scales. Uh, we're inviting clubs that are in our area. There are about eight of them. And uh, they uh, will all be eventually invited to come in and set up their own layouts. We want to have uh, a space for students to come in and set up their uh, layouts and using the uh, STEM uh, concepts that they're learning in school, uh, we want them to come in and use those concepts to build their own uh, uh, bridges and architectural um, uh, models and uh, landscaping and um, just uh, and use their mathematics to do grades and all that stuff. Um, and uh, maybe they could get a little credit for it at their school. So we're uh, talking to the school boards and trying to, uh, you know, connect with them and corroborate uh, our museum with them. Our museum could be uh, sort of a, um, a place where they could actually um, do their uh, sort of like a laboratory where they can uh, actually use the materials that they're uh, and the concepts that they're learning about. <clears throat> a lot of our museum is going to be about education and teaching and uh, and we do have a historian on our staff and he is um, really helping us a lot. Uh, our area, Hampton Roads, is one of the uh, biggest uh, historical areas of uh, railroading in the country. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to uh, show that in the museum uh, when we get it going. Um, and we'll have a library there. We'll have classes. We'll have clinics. We'll probably sponsor some train shows. Um, and... Uh, you know, we, we do ha uh, have a traveling exhibit, too. In fact, I spent the afternoon going to the North Suffolk Library, setting up a train for them um, in the name of our Model Railroad Museum. So we're uh, getting involved in the community that way. Uh, <clears throat> we're uh, accepting um, uh, emails from volunteers uh, frequently. We get a lot of donations of equipment, uh, especially HO stuff from people that have read our website. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people are interested. I get emails all the time for, for from people wondering when the museum is going to open and all of that. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of interest. We just got to get it going. We're, uh, uh, and oh, I just want to mention, you know, the website, if you want to go on there, it's it's mrmhr.org. And um, if you go there and sign up for our newsletter, you can see what we're all about. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe give us a, a dollar or two, if you don't mind, uh, to help us get going. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, if, uh, if, if anybody has any questions, be glad to answer them. Um, Greg uh, uh, Leapart is also on this uh, video. If he wants to say anything, uh, I'll be glad to, to have him uh, talk as well. But that's pretty much it. Um, back to you, Jim. Greg, I, I really uh, I really appreciate you and, and uh, the other Greg taking your time this <laughs> evening to uh, join us. And I'm glad to hear that it seems like it's going very well for you trying to put this together. It can't be the easiest project in the world to stay in time. But uh, I, I admire you so much for uh, taking this on and, and trying to work with the kids program uh, in your area. Uh, I think that's so important for our hobby. Uh, I hear people tell me all the time, if we can't attract young people into this hobby, then in 10 years, we may not have the trade associations that we have today. We may not even have any manufacturers that can afford to stay in the business as we have today. So attracting the young people into our hobby, I think is critical. And I think uh, projects like you're doing uh, with this museum are exactly what's needed around the country in order to make that happen. 
So congratulations and best of luck to you. Well, thank you, Jim. Hey, hey, Jim and Greg, the only thing I would say add to that is we are meeting weekly uh, with with our board and a dedicated group of model railroaders who um, are actively involved and, and share an interest in this project. And uh, one of the unique things, while we don't have a building, we did have some wonderful connections with um, offers to help uh, set up with some other organizations and like churches uh, and, and service groups who may have breakfast with Santa and uh, we made an offer to uh, help them set up any Christmas displays or uh, even families that are interested in putting a small layout under their tree. Uh, many of us older, uh, I, I hate to put an age on old, but we all it seems have a train story in our background you know growing up with trains a train under the christmas tree and we are trying to share that um that's event great. in other people's lives greg thank you so much for sharing it with us i think it's just great both both of you thank you so much for being here this evening i hope you'll come back and greg i'll let leave it up to you again to uh, to let me know when you all want to come back and give us another update but uh, we do support you as much as we possibly can and, and best of luck and have a great holiday. Thanks Thank again, you. Jim, you too. Yes, sir, bye-bye. Well, now I wanna to turn to uh, Art Carlton. Uh, and the reason that, that I wanted Art on the, uh, the show is I truly believe that model railroading is an art form. And, uh, and frankly, art is uh, an artist and, and he can express it much better than I can. And that's why I wanted him to be on the show and, and talk to us about model railroading as an art form. So Art, welcome. Well, thank you, Jim. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. Great. I'm gonna take this one airpiece out. Sounds like I got echoing going in my head. Jim <laughs> and I spoke a, a quite a long time on the phone one day, I got a call from him and, and uh, he was talking about how this is in our form and i i'd have to say yes my background is uh as a, an investigator for 20 years worked in emergency management i just recently retired dealing with explosives hazardous materials i was always the first one volunteer to go out on the train wrecks in our local area um just so i get pictures of undercarriages and stuff like that because that's the best time but anyways going out there responding to these things you know, I, people always said, hey, you know, that, that that's an art form. And, and I was the first one to push back saying, no, I'm not one of those artsy fartsy type people, not at all. Um, however, my wife is an artist, she's an art teacher. And I wanted to get to know more what, what she was doing and understand her process. So I took it at the local college and art appreciation class. And I think I got more out of it to tell them who I am as an individual than actually learning about what my wife was doing. Um, so based on that is that um, I never thought modeling, and I'm sure a lot of you guys don't think modeling is, is an art form. It is in fact an art form. It, 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 it's not, you know, we, we've, we've talked about it through to this evening with uh, Dennis talking about painting and stuff. It's not painting a canvas or anything, maybe painting a backdrop. I saw some beautiful backdrops here tonight. Um, saw some beautiful models. And what people don't understand is that that is an art form. That truly is an art form. And when I presented a lot of this stuff to my instructor, um, she she was just flabbergasted because I've, I've been scale building models for 40 years now. I've got a 3,000 foot square building of O scale two rails um, um, that, that I work on. And and I learned from some of the some of the greats um, that have passed down their knowledge from building from some of the greats out of California, like Walt Disney and a lot of his model tiers. Um, so that has been carried down to me. But when I was talking to that instructor, she was basically 
you know, she just looked at me. She says, I'm sorry, but that's an art form. What you have done with your dioramas, with your layout, with your individual models and everything, that's an art form in itself. And um, so I got talking to her and I started realizing that you guys all you remember Van Gogh as an artist. He cut his ear off because uh, he heard voices in his head and stuff like that. Um, after studying him for a while, I realized that's what my wife's been telling me all these years is when I get to a point of, you know, I get tense and everything, she would tell me, go to your trains, go build a model. And I realized I needed that art form as much as anybody else. And I visualized that that's what Van Gogh went through is he had to work for a living. He couldn't do his artwork. And so his mind was, was, has all this pent up energy, you know, and you need to do something. You need to get it out because you have all these ideas and all these things you want to do. And that's the way I was with my models. And that's why I'm still am today with my models. Um, talking to that instructor and expressing this type of stuff, I begin to realize that, yes, I am an artist. As much as I push back on it because I was the macho guy. No, I'm not one of those artsy fartsy people. I'm not, no, don't put me in that category, please. I chase after bad guys who go after chemicals and all that stuff. Um, but after that class, I had a whole different art appreciation of my models, of my layouts um, that eventually led into building museum displays for local museums and everything where people would ooh and all over them as they would any painting and interpreting the history. Um, there's nothing more than I love to get a hold of a historical photo for a museum and replicate that in a diorama or building or what have you, and then bring it back to them because most historical photos are black and white. I convert the model 3D into color. It brings a whole different viewpoint of people's imagination. So that, that was basically what Jim and I was talking about was, was yes, this is an art form. And if you take it at that, I, I think you'll enjoy it a whole lot more. And I think if we kind of bring that across, I think we'll get more people interested in it, that, that it is an art form. There are so many different components of model railroading that, that, that ties into art, that ties into what we stereotype art work as. There is so much of that going on in model railroading that if we bring that to the forefront as well, I think you'll get more people interested in it. Um, God sakes, I know I know some of us guys are going to push back on it and say, uh-uh, I'm not an artist. I'm not one of those artsy-fartsy guys. You all can hear me. You hear it in your head right now. But uh, it, I was there, and now I've got a whole different viewpoint of it. I've got a whole different aspect of my modeling. My modeling is an art form. And it, it, it allows me to get away from the reality of the world, get things out of my head, whether we, we put it on canvas, we actually build a 3D form. And, you know, I, I, I saw the, 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 you know, the guy with his insulators. Well, I had these sitting around. Yeah, I, I've got a stockpile of stuff myself um, because I'm always going through stores or walking by something and, and thinking, thinking how can I use that for a model and that's what artists do that's truly what an artist does he figures out how he can use something a media of some sort in his next project his or her next project so Jim with that is there anything I missed I I, I need to any questions or anything like that you know to me it, it's uh, the appreciation uh, of, of, of what we see and, and being able to translate that that view of the world, into a model. Uh, I, I think that that is so creative and I think it deserves to be recognized as an art form. And I don't think it is. And I think a lot of us, uh, you know, we, we don't want to be called artsy fartsy. And, and so we, oh. we we say, well, you know, I, I, I'm i not that, I, I'm not an artist. Well, in, in fact, a lot of us are. Uh, and I'm not saying I am, but I say a lot of model railroaders are true artists in my opinion. And I think they ought to be recognized as such. I think one day museums and galleries are going to want to show our models uh, and they're gonna get a good price for them. Uh, you look at other hobbies, uh, boat building is an example. 
uh, and they have exhibits in museums and in, in galleries. And their models of some boats that they, they make uh, sell for an awful pricey sum. And I think some of the models that are built by model railroaders are just as desirable and uh, should get the same kind of recognition from the art community. And, and art, it's people like you that can express that rather than me just talking about it, that, that's, I think, important for other modelers to hear. And particularly from a person with your background, you're not exactly the kind of guy that I would want to walk up at a dark alley and meet and call him artsy fartsy. So uh, with, with that said, does anybody have any comments to art? Just, just take a moment, guys, and look around your layout. Look at the stuff that you built. Um, there's probably some very unique things out there that nobody's built before, and it, it it's a it's a sculpture, it's a piece of art, and look at it that way. So I'll, I'll tap pop any questions if you guys have any. Anybody have any questions for Art? Well, Art, as you know, I I can't thank you enough for being here this evening. If you ever want to come back, you're most welcome. I look forward to, uh, to talking to you some more. And thanks again for your viewpoint. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jim. And I'll, I, I like what I'm seeing, and I'll definitely probably be back. Thank you so much, sir. Night. Mm -hmm. Well, next, I want to turn to Jeff Jordan, who's kit bashing a station so that it looks like a prototype that he wants to have built. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Mm. Just trying to figure out how to get my screen up here. Here we go. Share screen. Share. And it says participants can now see my screen. I all I see is the word Zoom. Yeah, I, I don't understand why. Uh... Pat, can you uh, help him with? Uh... There we go. You got it, Jeff. Just hit that hit that screen down at the bottom right, and you're done. There we go. Great. Okay, this fits very nicely with the mentions of Kit Bash tonight. Uh, that I was called upon by my club, as you may recall, in the past. I've discussed my club is in the midst of a project to reconstruct the historic 1915 B and O Depot in Middletown, Virginia and are in the midst of fundraising in cooperation with the town of Middletown, who's enthusiastically supporting this and, and raising money as well. And one of the things the club decided they needed to help do this was a model of what we were trying to achieve. Uh, and when a fellow who was going to scratch build the structure became incapacitated and they kind of looked around and said, well, what do we do now? And I said, well, I think I can kit bash something that won't be exact, but it'll be close. And I thought it would be interesting to show you how I took a commercially available kit and modified it to uh, resemble the prototype. So there's the prototype. That's the Baltimore and Ohio station that once stood in Middletown, Virginia. Today, it's a vacant lot. Uh, and we are in the midst of uh, planning, plans, uh, permitting and so forth and hope in a couple of months we'll actually start moving dirt but that's the building I needed to replicate I searched high and low up and far and wide on the internet nobody makes a model of a station that looks like that uh, and I wanted to get a jump start on this I could have uh, collected all the bits and pieces uh, and and uh, taking a shot at scratch building. And as you've seen, I've done a number of styrene scratch builds in the past. But then I discovered this. This is Altoona Model Works' uh, kit called the Branch Line Station. And though it's not an exact replica with a number of steps, it was able to be modified to closely resemble uh, the prototype. And you've seen my preview and at the end, I'll put them side by side, but this is the model kit that I acquired to modify to build the station. And so uh, the purpose of tonight and, and um, following three weeks after this is to show you how I modified the kit. It's not 
you know, how to build a wooden kit, but how I modified this particular wooden kit uh, to make it resemble the prototype. So with that, the Altoona Model Works kit has got an interesting approach. It comes with a core and that's masonite. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. So it's very stout and gives you a very solid core to build the structure on. But then it also required a fairly stout uh, material had to be modified to more closely resemble the prototype. And so here, uh, those are actually the two, the front and the back wall and, and the two ends. And I'm showing how I modified them. In the center there, the long wall is going to be the back wall. Uh, you can see that the front wall was identical in the kit. And I tried or I added a window that wasn't in the prototype or wasn't in the kit, but was in the prototype. And so with a bandsaw drilled and cut out an opening for an additional window. The other trick is you noticed in the window, this building is remarkably narrow. And so I wanted to narrow the building to more closely resemble the prototype. So this is the stock end and with the bandsaw, just cut off uh, those pieces so that this approximates the width of the prototype. And then what to do with these bits, rather than throw them away, I glued them on the ends of the uh, sides there. So the building is narrower than the kit started out and it's longer by adding those bits on to the ends. Uh, you lose in the process the tab and slot construction, but that's not a big deal. Uh, there it is. Uh, the four sides glued together. Also, uh, the gables have been in place, though not yet trimmed to match the new roof line um, and clamped together. And you can't quite see in the photograph. In the interior there, I actually have little squares in the corners to make sure everything comes out nice and square. The kit also does come with this piece, which I preserved which helps stabilize the long walls. So next, the kit is finished with a siding material, very nice scribed siding, wood scribed siding material uh, that matches the original base. And so you have to modify the ends and the sides to match the now modified base. So on the far right here, you can see this is the stock part flipped upside down where I've marked where to cut to match the modified base. And then here's the other one cut and, and just cut simply with a little square, metal square and a sharp, fresh X-Acto knife carved those pieces right off. Notice that you also had to no modify the roof line a little bit because when you moved the ends in, uh, and you want the roof to come out at the same place, it, it drops a little bit more quickly. So you carve that off as well. So the ends are easy, but now the sides, uh, because they've been lengthened, you need to make up the material. And so using the material that I cut off the ends, you can see that you can put it in place uh, on the sides. Here's the, the manufacturer's original sides set in place, lined up with the windows and doors, and then the additional piece laid in place, marked with a sharp pencil, uh, and then again with a straight edge and a sharp knife blade trimmed to fit. Then the last step for tonight is, here's the new window where I took the bandsaw and opened an opening in the base and now need to cut out uh, that. And again, it's clamped in place exactly in the right spot. Again, a sharp pencil gives me this outline on the interior of where I need it to cut it out. Uh, notice that the uh, opening here, unlike the other openings in the kit, which are oversized, is cut pretty close to the appropriate size of the window casting. And so it's outlined here. And then because I'm going to start cutting this thin siding material, I've both taped it here to help prevent it from splitting. And while I was at it, I also put a piece of painter's tape 
on the other side, pressed into each of the slots on the siding to prepare for cutting. And I would come back again with this metal square and an X-Acto knife and cut that out. And so that's as far as I'm going to get tonight. Uh, next week, uh, I will show you how I actually cut that out, and, uh, install windows, install trim, and also modify the roof, which is a significant change from the stock kit, but just using the materials that come in the kit. Uh, but for purchasing one more Grantline window, fortunately, the kit uses Grantline windows, and I was able to match it uh, by buying another Grantline window. Everything else in the basic structure came out of the kit box and uh, a supply of a little bit of strip wood. Now you'll see ultimately add some details, but the building is just pretty much out of the box, but reformatted to more closely resemble the prototype. So that's what I've got for tonight. And next week I'll pick up with the roof modifications. Anybody had any questions for Jeff? Comments, suggestions? Hateful remarks. <laughs> it's a nice kit, incidentally, and if anybody is interested in it, Altoona Bottle Works is on the web, and the kit is currently available. Jeff, I appreciate it so very much. Thanks so much for your help. Thank you. I want to share something with uh, the audience here. You've heard me talk earlier tonight and get uh, a little bit upset uh, that I haven't been able to, uh, to reach people about contributing to our scholarship. And you're right, I am extremely upset about this. Uh, when I started writing new tracks articles for the two magazines, S Scale Resource and O Scale Resource, and, and this will be going on, the next article is seven years I've been doing that, every issue. I called up the small manufacturers and I said, look, you don't have to buy an ad. I, I don't wanna charge you anything. I want to profile you and your company. You can write as much about yourself and your modeling and about your company, when and why it was started, the models that you produce, your future plans for your company, and I'll print every word of it. Send me pictures, no more than 10, plus a picture of yourself so that people can identify you with your company. Won't charge you a penny for it. I do ask, that we hold a contest drawing for one of your products, you pick the product, and we select one viewer who sends in their email address and all of their contact information as the contest drawing winner. And you provide that modeler a model of you that you produce, whatever it is, whatever you tell me you want in that contest, I'll, that's what I'll enter in there. That's your total cost. That's all it costs you. No advertising. Ask Martin what it costs for, for three or four pages in a magazine, talking nothing about your company. Ask him what, what an advertisement would charge, would cost you for that. But I was so concerned about the small manufacturers and trying to do everything that we could to help them. I thought this was a way of getting the exposure in, a, in the magazines. Uh, and some of the manufacturers, if they produce the products in both S scale and O scale, I put them in both magazines. One in S scale model, one for an O scale model. Well, now we turn to our scholarship. I hope they appreciated the effort that I went to, number one, to find them. Number two, to personally call each one of them and talk to them. Number three, to take the information they, they gave and put it in a format that could be printed and published. Uh, and number four, advertise to the people uh, that, that this is a company that is for you, that is committed to you, that is willing to show you what they produce in order to get you more familiar with their company. And they, they don't wanna spend big bucks on having to advertise on a monthly basis in a magazine. That was their only cost. Well, now I'm reaching out to those same companies, and you can imagine how many of them there may be that have either been on this show and done build-alongs, or in one of those magazine articles over the past seven years, 
and going on, we're going into our fifth year next year for this show, five years every week on this show. So you can imagine how many small manufacturers that is. Well, Chris Course is one of them and he's contributed. Uh, Greg Cassidy is not one of them, but he has contributed and he knows what I'm talking about. Greg Cassidy also knows, and so does Chris, that back during really when there weren't any train shows being held anywhere in the world because of the pandemic, new tracks, which meant Dylan Lambert and myself held four different train shows, virtual train shows. We charged each manufacturer $10 for five minutes. $10, they got five minutes time on the show. Those shows ran anywhere from three to four hours each. And Dylan and I were there for every second of it. We never ask anything from those manufacturers, just do you want to spend $10 to have five minutes? And if you do, then we'll talk about you <coughs> and you'll be part of the show. We didn't get a penny for it. Didn't ask for anything for it. We were glad to do it. We thought the hobby needed it. I am convinced the hobby needs to reach out to young people. I am convinced the scholarship is a major thrust to do that. And I do not understand why those small manufacturers don't recognize the potential of reaching out to those small, small, uh, uh, to those young modelers through the scholarship program. And if, and if spending $5 on the scholarship program is too much for them. I'm so sorry. Now, I don't think that's unreasonable, but where are they? With that said, and tonight so far, we have got zero contributions from anybody. After all I have said tonight about our scholarship program, zero contributions. Okay. Now I want to turn to uh, Earl Hackett, uh, who is doing a build along for Lambert Locomotive Works of one of their new products. It's a commuter coach. So Earl, welcome. Uh, you, oh, I got unmuted, okay. <laughs> There we are. Can you see the, see the first I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm talking too much tonight, Earl. <laughs> okay. So you got you the first, well, it's got you, the first slides up there. I think you can see that. Um, this was, uh, the, the model was designed by Lambert uh, Locomotive Works. It was printed by 3DP Trains, and uh, I've had the privilege of building this thing. It, it came out, it, it, it's a it turned out to be a beautiful model. Um, now I'm a CNO modeler, and the CNO never offered commuter service anywhere on their line. So I called up the CNO historical group and I said, "Talk, hey, what, uh, what can I do with this thing?" And they said, "Oh, well, they had what they called employee cars, and because they ran through, through such uh, inaccessible territory, uh, they had a train that went around in the morning and picked up employees from." various towns, brought them into the depot and took them home at night. And they used commuter mm -hmm. coaches. And this is one of them. And if I, when I went and look in my, uh, 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 looked up all the diagrams I have of these things, these employee co cars, they had torn out all the seats and put in benches, just lo longitudinal benches. But as you can see that this one has seats in it. You can see them all along there. So I said, that's going to be the prototype. That's what I'm going to build it for. So this is the this is what we wound up with. Now the roof is different, but I don't care. I'm, it's close enough for me. And I, I thought it came out. It, 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 there was some problems with it, but it, it came out. I think it came out just fine. The first attempt was the problem. This was originally built as an O scale model. And they just shrunk it down to HO scale. And when you do that, as I mentioned in uh, one of my 
presentations on 3D printing, uh, you can wind up making it too thin and things can fail. That's what happened here. This this section here got thinned out, thinned out so much that it warped. So we had to do it over again. And what I got back was this. And this is a very, very nice print. Um, great rivet detail. Uh, the one thing I found surprising about it, they were using a resin that is so flexible. It's almost like, like rubber. And I was wondering how that was going to work out, but it worked out quite well. I, I had my doubts to tell you the truth of the first, in the first beginning. Uh, here you can see the rivet detail. It's, it's really excellent. Um, the other things that are in the box, they include trucks. Uh, then you have a whole bunch of seats, uh, some doors, and for some of there, there's several designs that he, he worked around, uh, some for New York Central, some for Pensy, some for others, but they all had slightly different uh, end configurations. And he supplies the uh, 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 parts to make any one of the configurations you want to model. Um, the one, the one part that I we didn't redo, and I, maybe we should have. This was the uh, the floor, and you can see that it's warped somewhat, but it was so flexible. I figured, well, we'll be able to use this. I could just bend it up there and glue it in place, and it'll work just fine. So we didn't replace that one. These are the trucks. Excellent detail on these things, and they're they're pretty darn flat. This the this one here was slightly out of out of kilter. And that the wheel isn't quite touching the the rail, but when you put the car on it, it's plenty of weight to squash it down. And it'll it'll work just fine. Um, they recommended using the KD wheel sets. Uh, I found those to not really be very free rolling, so I put in uh, Intermountain wheel sets, and they work they work just fine. Tools, not you don't need many. This is this is really not much more difficult than the old uh, shake a box kit from Atherm years and years ago. Uh, one tool that I've, uh, is a scalpel, some nippers, and this guy here is a dental drill. This thing is a lifesaver when I'm building models. I just have some uh, sanding disc in there right now, but you'll see how I use it for doing the, the grab rail, so why it's so nice for, for that uh, later on. Well, next week. One of the things I do do, uh, I built is a, I use a lot of sanding discs and to remove them, I took an old compass, an uh, ink compass, cut off one of the uh, edges and sharpened this point up nice and sharp. And now you, one or two spins around and you have yourself a fresh uh, sanding disc of whatever grade of whatever grit you want. And that this has turned out to be a real handy little device that I've used pretty much on every model I work with. And I'll say something about adhesives. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, CA glues, but this uh, DAP Rapid Fuse seems to be a really nice product. It's a, a thickened liquid and it stores pretty well. I, I, had, I had one that's a year old and it was still perfectly good. I hadn't, uh, uh, still usable. Uh, this one here is a very liquidy one. I just picked up this at the hardware store because I needed a real one that could wick into cracks and crevices. But welder is one of my favorite adhesives. It's sort of like Walther's goo on steroids. It once it sets up, boy, it 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 it's really strong. So parts, you have to prepare the parts. One of the problems you have in three D printing is you have supports, and the supports are little things that support, well, they, they su provide support for the resin as it's being uh, cured, as it's printing. And, but to pull them off, they leave all these little dimples all over the place. And so you have to get rid of them. And the other thing you have to work on, you have to go over and look for any supports like these, right? These will be hiding in here, here and here, and you may not notice them until you paint it, and then it's too late. So you go over very, very carefully looking for any of these supports that are or waiting to be tripped up. And you just take the little nippers and clip, clip, and they're gone. A uh, little, maybe a touch up with the uh, scalpel and remove them. This stuff was so, so flexible. Uh, you could easily carve it with a scalpel. And that was, uh, and I had to in a couple spots. 
So once you get ready to go, uh, you take all your seats and you're going to, you're going to paint everything first. And in this case, I wanted to keep the bonding surfaces clean. And so I clamped them between a couple of pieces of wood and they were, they were on my downdraft table here. And, uh, I just picked a, a can of uh, green Krylon, that, a nice color, so have green seats, and spray the whole business up in, in, in two shots. But holding them this way keeps the, uh, the uh, little bottom parts uh, clean without any paint on them, so you get a good bond. Now, if you're going to, uh, if you get parts that are, that are still mounted, here you can see the supports that are holding the parts. You can glue these things, you pop these off the build plate and you can glue them down on some painter's tape and spray them that way. And uh, that, that's actually easier to handle than the other. Now, one thing that we did run into the, as I said, these first parts, these were reduced from O scale and the little handles uh, didn't come out very well. So we redid those, but I didn't have time to wait for that. So I, I did a quick job of printing up some seats. These are more like a regular coach seat than a commuter seat. And I use these. But the coach seats you get in the kit, these are the ones he sent me. I got them just two weeks ago. He even put in a padded armrest here. So uh, these are these are HO scale and really nicely done. You have a couple of little discs here to uh, set the height above the uh, floor so that they don't, you know, they'll come on, all come out at exactly the same height. So these these are the ones that'll be being that are being supplied uh, with the kit. Seat installation is pretty straightforward. Um, I just took a no, I had to these holes all plugged up a little bit from from printing, and that that sort of surprised me because I these are big holes, uh, and I, I I don't I, I have I've not had a problem with holes plugging up in, in my printers, but uh, anyway they plugged up and it. It took all of two minutes with the number 55 drill to just go through and clean them out so that they were, uh, uh, you could put the seats in them. Uh, I just masked off the steps here. They'll be painted later black, but this was, uh, this was uh, just spray painted with a brown primer of some sort. Again, Krylon or, or uh, well, what's the other one? Uh, yeah, the other one of the other guys. But um, so I, I've sanded off, I sanded off all the, uh, not knobs, little bumps and stuff, and spray painted it. This will be the hole for the uh, screw for holding the trucks on. And so the seats are installed. And uh, well, for installation, what I did for these the installation, I put a puddle of goo. I mean, uh, my welder out on the t on a piece of paper, and I just dip the seat in the in the welder, stick them in the hole, dip it in the welder, stick it in the hole, and they were all mounted in a in a matter of about ten minutes. So it was uh, very, so far, it's a very easy installation. There's some problems later on, which we'll get into, but they're easy to circumvent. But um, the kit went together very easily. And I was surprised how well this really soft material uh, behaves when you're working with it. So that's all until next week. We have, when we have part two. And uh, anybody have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I'd like to say thank you, Earl. Oh, you're welcome. From from your friends at Lambert Locomotive Works. Yeah. No, that that, that is a, it, it turned out to be a, well. You'll I'll have a better picture of the finished model later on, but it turned out just beautifully. Right. It and, was. A, I was I, when I first when Jim first asked me to do this. I said, "What am I going to do with this thing? I, I don't. They don't have any commuter stuff." But, I I remember when you and I some of the stuff that Earl like when we first ran into the issues. I think at that point I had made like 20 or 30 of these coaches and Earl was the person who ran into the problems. So go figure. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I actually reached, there was the, the frame. It's like, okay, we know the frame did that. And yeah. we're like, okay, great. The ends warping the way they did. We're like, what in the world happened here? There was one other issue. Now on some of the earlier kits, you'll notice there's like a grill in the ventilators and Earl, when he got his, it's like, Hey, there's resin come. There's resin all over the sides of it. And I'm like, what in the world? So I had a prototype here. I literally, I'm going through the CAD file. I'm looking at the prototype. The ventilators behind the grill was hollow. Now I never, on the O scale cars when I got those, it was never an issue. 
because it was large enough you could easily clean it out. So when they were the printers processed it, they came out great. I reached out to the people who made who bought them, and I had one person come back say they had resin like what Earl saw. They're like, I came off with rubbing alcohol, so I didn't think to tell you anything. And I'm like, well, can someone say it, please? Nothing personal. This is the type of thing I like finding beforehand. So the version Earl has is the ventilator solid to basically eliminate a place that resin could hide, that it could run down the side of the model or get stuck in the packaging. Yeah. So there, that's good. The ends, those joints all got thickened up. Um, I did add a little bit of thickness to the frame. Not much, but enough to help it a little bit more. Um, and of course, we saw the seats. Now, keep in mind, this is all scaled down from O. Uh, and wall thick we did tweak the wall thicknesses after Earl ran into the issues because of like, okay. Obviously, if one person's gonna run into it, could be others. Let's fix it so we don't have to deal with it. Um, so that's good. And even even the seat pegs, that was based on Earl's feedback. Um, I did tweak up the arms a little bit. Now keep in mind these seats are not prototypical. The seat design originated with an engineer's seat that I widened into a flip over bench, which was it was based off an O scale brass part because I couldn't find good scale drawings of the seats that Uzgood Bradley built. So this helped. And I even noticed your picture of that employee car. Did you notice it's the same trucks under it too, Earl? Because I picked yeah. up on that. <laughs> yeah. Even the, I, I, I'm, it's a, I'm glad that it's working out well. And so far, like I said, if Earl, I have no problem with, I want to know the issues. If there's someone who's run into a problem other than Earl, tell me, then I can make sure we fix it. Because if there's something else that I missed that say hasn't come up before, let's make sure. I, I, I want to yeah. make sure that you're getting a good model period. Uh, and it, it's my it, name it, on the box. Yeah. And it came out. It's, it's, it's just, it's coming out beautifully. It, it's, well, I, I'm, I've got it pretty much. I haven't don't have it really completed. I, 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 I generally don't under build the underbody. I don't bother with that. You can't see it. I don't build it, but you can see the brake rods coming down. So I'm probably going to flip it over and put those on. Yeah. So when I did <laughs> the O scale, the O scale ones, I did with brass with brass tubing because it was basically one piece. You could just slip a piece of tubing over the stubs. It's a little bit smaller in your size, so I found that wire works better. Yeah, I have a, I, I have, a, I have a spring steel uh, wire that I use. That's it's actually what I've been using for my brake piping because it doesn't deform easily. When I was messing with the brass on my prototypes, I'm like, I don't like how easily this dents. Yeah. So, but no, it does look good. And I appreciate it, Earl. Yeah, it's really it's really came out good. What do you see? How I well, you'll be interested how I did the uh, grab irons. Yeah, no, that, that I want to see because now I might have to go buy one of those drills. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to buy one. All righty, very good. All right, uh, Dylan. Thank you, Dylan. I'm right Dylan, here. Don't go away. I'm uh, not going away. Dylan, uh, I sure would appreciate a donation to our scholarship. <laughs> well, I have those G39. Oh, the scholarship. I think I can make that happen. Oh, I would appreciate it. Listen, I'm wondering this. I, I think $1,000 from all of the various manufacturers, if they could come up with 1000 bucks, boy, that would sure help a long way. Uh, you know, we, we could do a lot of scholarship with $1,000, Dylan. How about, how about talking to your buddies and let's make that happen? pass the word around see what we can see what i can get up oh i would appreciate it. you let me know it's got to be done by the end of this year so that everybody gets the uh, tax deduction and they can use zephy because keep in mind and you can tell your buddies a uh, hundred percent of whatever they donate to zephy goes straight to the to, straight to the scholarship so dylan i really we really need to get the scholarship fund going we're spending a lot of time and effort and, and frankly, I, I'm convinced this is going to help bring young people into this hobby. And as you know, that's only going to help your business long term. Right. And now you mentioned something. Now you mentioned, you know, I'll, I'll double check with you on, on the other thing. I thought I heard you mention this because I was half paying attention because, hey, it's got gold out. I guess <laughs> I've been, I, 
<laughs> I've literally, I, I did an overdue update on various O-Scale projects tonight because I looked at Facebook. I'm like, I haven't really posted anything for weeks because I've been so busy. I should take care of that tonight. Yes, yes. So, but anyway, talk to your buddies. Set a thousand dollars. They ought to be between them, as many of them out there, Dylan and, and Dylan. For anybody that doesn't know, Dylan stepped up when we first started these shows seven years ago. Dylan said, "Okay, I'll I'll do all the technical stuff because Jim, I understand you're incompetent," and he was right. <laughs> and so he did all the technical stuff that had to be done for all of those shows. Dylan was there every minute for those four-hour train shows that we did. Remember those, Dylan? Oh, God, don't remind me. I still I still have nightmares. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, running those was tough. It was remember, tough doing the back end on those. Do you remember Greg Cassidy? Greg Cassidy only worked on a couple of them and then quit because it was too much trouble trying to get the manufacturers to even send in the information so that we could put them it on was, the it was a tough. It was a tough thing to do. Don't get me wrong. I think at the end of the day, the shows did come out looking good. We did yeah. it because everyone was stuck at home because COVID, and but my, it it was a tough thing to do on the back end because you're trying to make sure everything is as seamless as possible for a live broadcast. All it takes is one computer glitch, and you've got like ten seconds of dead air, and yeah, it was it was, it, 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 it was very tough. It was fun though, and and you know, and we ended up we had a thousand viewers. And I never will forget that we hit a thousand viewers, and we thought, my gosh, we've arrived! Isn't this something? How many? Because some of the train shows, the dealers were saying, "Hey, we don't see a thousand people at train show," and they were able to sit in their home and they were getting the views of their products and being able to talk to these people for five minutes, and we charged them ten bucks. Remember that, Dylan? Oh yeah. So Dylan, hey, you talked. To you talk to these people, Dylan, $1,000, that's our goal for the manufacturers. And each person that contributes, make sure you get their name. Because next week, Dylan, I want you to come on the show and we'll list their names so that we can make sure everybody gets credit for their donation. I'll see what I can do. Thanks so much, Dylan. I appreciate it as always. Now, You're welcome. Tonight, tonight so far, we have uh, three people that have donated. Art Carlton donated. Remember, Art was the one that talked about model railroading as an art farm. He donated money to our scholarship. Uh, Greg Greff, you remember? Greg is, is trying to put together a museum. He needs money for his museum. He donated to our scholarship fund. Daniel Brewster, a uh, brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E -E donated to our scholarship fund. Out of all the people, and there's roughly 60 people on this uh, view right now, out of all of that, and some of you have already donated, I understand that, but we had three new donors tonight. Uh, and I really do appreciate their donation, but I'm telling you, 10 bucks, my gosh, come on. I mean, you know, this, this, is, this is for the benefit of our hobby long-term. I'm telling you, the kids need to get involved in our hobby and we're not paying any attention to them. I talk to people every day. One of the questions I get is, why wasn't this started 20 years ago? Why are we just trying to do it now? And the answer is, it's hard work and nobody wanted to bother. Now, it's as simple as that. And we're taking it on. Why? I guess because I'm an old guy and I don't have anything better to do with my life. And my wife says, I'm crazy for doing it. But I believe in it. This hobby has been good to me. It's a part of my life. I love to build models. I love to talk to other model railroaders. I love to help other model railroaders. Well, this is our opportunity to keep this hobby going and help the future kids that are gonna be the modelers once we're not here anymore. And if we want this hobby to stay, we have got to get them involved. That's why we support the museum that you heard talked about tonight. That's why the scholarship. So guys, I know money's tight right now, but we're not asking for an arm and a leg. We're just asking for your name. Participate. Show the young modelers that the modelers of today care enough about our hobby and about their participation in our hobby that we're willing to help them fund their education. Well, with that said, 
Pat, how about running the caboose tonight and we'll close this show down. Thank you all so very much. Uh, sorry about all my rants, but I truly believe in what we're doing. And uh, that's the only way I know to try to make it happen. Thanks so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, most important, I hope you learned something. See you next week.